everybody to the North Dakota Department of Agriculture's free sustainable agriculture webinar. Today we have BSC's Assistant Professor of Agriculture Technology and Natural Resources, Marco Dovinik. Um, he is going to give us an overview of sustainable farming in North Dakota through Soil Health. So um, go ahead, Marco, and tell us about your project. Okay, well, well thank you. Um, glad to be here. Uh, just before we start, can you guys see the my presentation that I'm sharing? Global Sustainable Agriculture in North Dakota? It looks good. Okay, excellent. So uh, thank you for that intro. My name is Marco uh, Davinich, and uh, uh, this is my sixth year here at BSC. I'm a soil scientist. Uh, I have a PhD in soil science. However, I'm not the traditional ag professor or ag professional because uh, my master's degree is actually microbiology immunology and I worked on human pathogens and I transferred to plant and soil pathogens and soil microbiology through through bacteria and fungi. Uh, I also have a, an MBA in finance and, and statistics so I like to put kind of like a little monetary effect or monetary uh, uh, aspect on the on agriculture in general. Um, my, my expertise is soil health, uh, but today we will be talking about global sustainable agriculture and how does North Dakota fit in this, uh, this scheme. So uh, first of all, let's start with what is definition of sustainable agriculture. And I believe a lot of my students here at BSC have a hard time uh, kind of understanding that sustainable agriculture is more than just producing. Yes, uh, producing is one big aspect of how can we produce more food. Uh, however, according to uh, Congress and uh, the trade, uh, the Food Agriculture Conservation and Trade Act of 1990, uh, sustainable agriculture is more than just producing food. Uh, it's also to enhance environmental quality. Uh, and uh, efficient use is another big point of this act that was passed in 1990s, or how to make the most efficient use of these non-renewable resources that we have and that we use in agriculture. Another point was to sustain economic viability of the farm operations. Uh, that means that we can farm for a long, long time, and then to enhance the quality of life. For not for farmers and the entire society. So when we talk about su sustainable agriculture or sustainable agriculture in North Dakota or globally, it's not just producing food, it's producing food long term without having any negative effect on environment or society in general. So it is a way more complex issue than just producing food to feed, let's say, another like 10 billion people, another 3 billion people by 2050. Now by textbook, sustainable agriculture is similar concept. So again, there's a goal is to minimize adverse impact that farming may have on the environment while producing sustainable level of production or, or, or food and, uh, and fiber and energy. Um, sustainability is has to be extended globally. So this is not necessarily North Dakota or US or even North America mission. This is a global mission. So just because North Dakota could be a really efficient in producing food and maybe follows these uh, sustainable agriculture methods, it doesn't mean that we as a, as a world will succeed. So uh, simply stated, sustainable agriculture is ability to farm to produce food indefinitely or to produce a uh, product, food, energy, fiber, uh, indefinitely without causing irreversible damage to the ecosystem. In general, or in, in one, uh, sustainable agriculture goal is to be efficient and to have a balanced system. Now, there's going to be a negative impact of farming, and there always was one. Um, there's environmental issues caused by farming. There are human impacts. Um, environmental damages is, is reduced biodiversity, uh, habitat destruction, deforestation. We see that globally. 
uh, water and air and soil pollution is another issue. My doctorate in soils was from West Texas. I was part of the big grant project that worked on reducing water usage in farming because uh, Ogallala Aquifer that they're using, and that's that image over here on the right, is being severely depleted since 1950s uh, to two, early 2000s, 2010. We have Ogallala Aquifer being depleted by around 200 feet. So we are talking about uh, underground lake that's been just shrinked to uh, by 200 feet of uh, water depth. Uh, definitely not something that uh, could be continued in a long term using water in that amount. So uh, sustainable farming or su sustainable agriculture in Texas is going to be uh, drastically changing the way they farm. Uh, now, how we're going to do that in North Dakota will be different as we have different impacts and uh, different types of farming in here, different soil type and different overall environment. Uh, I'm sharing a few things from, this is NASA's uh, observation, NASA, NASA data on how does some of these, these uh, greenhouse emissions uh, and how different types of production, uh, we say livestock is in here, uh, rice, and those two are ag related type of fields. Now these are global. These are not just necessarily US, but it shows that some of these agriculture systems do emit a lot of greenhouse gases. In this case, it's a methane. Uh, this is more recent one. This picture shows st stubble burning in North India. Actually, this is from a few days ago. So every year in October and November, the farmers in uh, India, North India, would burn all of their stubble so they can go ahead and plant because they have a season that in, it, it, the year has two season growing seasons. And they have to burn off their stubble because their soil cannot um, timely decompose all of this organic matter. And this emits 8 million tons of carbon within a month. So. Uh, definitely something that's not sustainable, definitely something that, you know, losing all that carbon every year uh, could not be done every year and have uh, any form of uh, sustainable form of agriculture in this country. Uh, well, how, how are we going to feed 10 billion people by 2050? And that's the question that sustainable agriculture should answer. Uh, according to the World Resource Institute, uh, we will have to do a lot of different things and adopt to uh, to accommodate uh, this rise in food demand. At the same time, researchers say that we should cut the greenhouse gas emission and not expand the agricultural land, so not deforest further land, but uh, seems like almost impossible task. So let me summarize this. Uh, so this is according to this um, World Resource Institute, which is a DC based nonprofit and has over 250 researchers all over the globe. Uh, what I'm using their data is because I believe uh, that our Congress is in sync with some of their findings and some of their research data. So we could easily see some of these concepts being applied onto what is expected of farming in the United States. So according to this research institute, creating a sustainable food future by 2050, 2050 is the year when we will need we will have about 10 billion people on this planet. We will have to increase the food production by 56% to feed nearly 10 billion people. However, without using any more land. So currently we are using 50% of the world vegetative land for agriculture. And if we were to feed this additional 3 million, we will need about uh, Agricultural land, it's about a size of two Indias. So 
what their researchers are saying is that that's not an option. We need to feed 3 billion people extra without increasing agri agricultural land. In the same time, they would like us to reduce the emission that agriculture is creating, the greenhouse gas emission, from 12 gigatons of carbon dioxide to 4 gigatons. And how are we going to do that? They propose we use innovating technology, and that's when we have all those concepts like drones, like precision agriculture, like zoning, uh, and even more sophisticated technology that's going to limit the methane production in livestock. Now, they're also saying these are some controversial type of topics that we have to change our diet, that we should be focusing on plant-based burgers. Uh, and, of course, to use more genetically modified organisms, come up with more resilient crop breeds that will allow us to generate more yield. So really complicated task, almost sounds almost impossible. What the researchers are proposing, we do in five stages. Now these stages will not apply in, in this order, and these stages may be prioritized in different way according to the continent, according to the country, according to the region, and according to the demand. I have over here from different studies, uh, what is the production, produ production outlook of demand? So demand for, for poultry or, or for beef, let's say, will be around 62. Now some may say 70% increase by 2050 poultry 104, pork 38. There's a huge demand for fishing, for aquaculture, to be increased by 90%, and then dairy by 55. The same thing with grain, 67 for, small, for, for corn, like small grain 38, rice 42, and then beans by 55, but overall around 60% increase. So how are we going to do this? So first stage is to reduce growth in demand for food. Second one is to increase food production. Third, to protect and restore natural resource systems. Fourth, I'm not going to focus a lot today because this is uh, to increase fish supply does not apply a lot to North Dakota. And then five, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So first stage, before we go into drones, before we go into precision agriculture and zoning and mapping, using a new forms of fertilizer, soil is fertilizer. First, they want to reduce the growth in demand for food and other agricultural products. To, by lowering demand, it's going to alleviate the pressure on ag system. And that makes a lot of sense. Because after all, we do all have finite limited sources, re resources on this planet, especially in different continents. So within that first stage, there's going to be a sub stage. A substage of, of first stage will be to reduce food loss. And that does make a lot of sense. And you can tell the different continents, different uh, parts of the world will have different issues. Where is this food loss happening and why are we so inefficient? Remember, sustainable agriculture is all about efficiency and balance. So in North America, we lose a lot of our, or we waste a lot of our food and ag products on consumption. That means you go to a restaurant, you don't complete your meal, or the restaurant doesn't sell all the meals and they throw it to garbage. Now, in developing countries, they have different types of waste. The consumption is waste is really low. They don't throw anything out. However, their production is low, handling and storage, so a lot of their their food is spoiled uh, on the way there, probably, or while stored, and then some on processing. So there is definitely a different trend uh, going from developing to less developed countries. However, what's going to have to change is probably a culture. Perhaps we, we reduce the, the size of meal that we are consuming. Perhaps we have a, a, a different types of, of food available on different days or we don't just have as many choices uh, to reduce the waste 
of, of these different food items. Now, the second thing that will have to happen to reduce the growth in demand is to shift to healthier, more sustainable diet. And this is the controversial one, but uh, nevertheless, I'm sure that everybody in here has some uh, experience some of the, the new marketing of plant-based uh, meats or a plant-based uh, protein as a substitute for meat protein. And what the research scientists that are promoting this are saying is that beef requires 20 more times land, meeting 20, 20, 20 times more greenhouse gases per gram compared to a plant-based protein like beans, like peas, like lentils. They are suggesting um, that we should reduce our intake of meats from three hamburgers a week to 1.5 hamburgers a week, and that will cut the greenhouse gases that's emitted by the livestock to half. Uh, and they're actually kind of quoting North America specifically uh, because of our large consumption of, of meat protein. Now, what kind of actions will they take? Well, it's going to require a lot of marketing, and we can see that happening. We see new companies being formed, Beyond Meat, Tattoo Chef. Beyond Meat actually creates these uh, plant-based meats, and then Tattoo Chef makes meals out of them. Uh, so this is an action that probably we will see more and more as time proceeds, as that's probably one of their plans in sustainable agriculture. Stage one continued with the third sub stage is to avoid competition from bioenergy for food crops and land. I can see this affecting some of our decision making, ag decision making in uh, in, in North Dakota, as we do have uh, for let, let's say uh, a crop energy crops um, and. What they're saying, the research scientists, is that all of the world's harvested biomass supply since 20, since 200s, 2000s, I'm sorry, is about 20% of global energy that's needed by 2050. They're saying that biomass is not a good energy source. And they have studies to show that from 2007, 2017, 2011. What they're saying is that energy should not be competing with food when it comes down to egg, egg produced energy. Uh, how are they going to do that? Well, first of all, it's going to depend on prices. So there is really no um, a way of predicting what's going to happen in this case. However, they may remove subsidies for biofuels and, and, and bioenergy, and they also may remove the label of carbon neutral. Uh, and in that case, they will shift towards more food production and not energy production. So that's to be the debated, I guess, in, in the future. Next stage of stage one, it's a sub stage four. This is a very controversial one. Um, we need to achieve replacement level fertility rates. In other words, uh, it's a fancy, nice way of saying population control. Uh, there, to, do, to do, reduce the demand of food, they will have to reduce demand of food by having less people in areas that can afford food or can generate food. Uh, in According to their maps, it's mostly Africa and Asia and certain parts of South America. How are they going to do that? It will, be ex it will be voluntary reducing fertility rates. So this will not be a Chinese one child type of, uh, of, of law. It will be more voluntary. It will, uh, by increasing education, Increasing education, for example, in opportunities for employment for girls in these in these continents, in these countries, expanding access to reproductive health services, reducing infant child mortality is an important one because some of these families in this less developed world will have five kids because they know that two or three of them will not make it through early childhood. But if we can reduce that mortality, they will have less children brought to the world. So it's a controversial one. Uh, so this is a fourth sub level. The fifth one is the one that will affect North Dakota, and we probably will work on this in North Dakota extensively, is to increase livestock and pasture productivity. Again, uh, research scientists view livestock as a, uh, a, a, an inefficient 
remember, sustainable agriculture is about efficiency and they view livestock as inefficient part of the system uh, and that we need to increase the efficiency of the pasture land. We need to increase the efficiency of feeds. Uh, and what kind of action can we take or farmers take? Well, you need to improve fertilization of the pasture, feed quality, and they're going to even improve the additions to the feed. So there are going to be special chemicals that you can add to your feed to improve the the uh, the quality and waste. And then raising improved animal breeds and governments will have to set productivity targets. Again, sustainable agriculture will be about efficiency, but it will require a lot of planning, a lot of targets, a lot of goals because otherwise we will not know how much of what we need to produce. And there's going to be a lot of technical assistance that these um, ranchers will, in this case, need. Now we're getting into stage two. So first stage is to, re, uh, was, or to reduce. Now we are into increasing. So we increase the livestock pasture productivity. We need to increase crop breeding. We need to have more new variety of crops that are capable of generating higher yields. Uh, and these are in a, in a purple average annual yield of the stock, of, of the crop, I'm sorry. Um, and yellow is what the future and average annual yield needs to be like. As you can see for wheat, they are not actually requiring a lot more efficiency. So I'm not expecting a lot more new wheat varieties coming up from, from the research scientists. Rice is the same way. Rice management is going to have to be changed, but rice itself as a culture not. Corn will need to be improved. Soybeans will have to be improved. Now, the most of the improvement is going to be in roots and tubers because apparently demand for them will increase significantly and fruits and vegetables. Pulses as well. Pulses will have to probably double the efficiency and, and the yields in order to satisfy the this um, expanding need for, for food source. So it really is all over the board. Some of them are doing really well as it is. Some of them will require uh, drastic improvements. Now, another point of how to increase food production is to improve soil water management. Now, this is probably the most important one for North Dakota. Uh, in these, uh, by the research study by the World Research Institute focuses on areas that have really low production, and they're giving an example of agroforestry. Uh, now, agroforestry as a system is a really interesting one. It does show amazing results in Africa, as we can see in here, it actually tripled the yields in corn by simply planting it across these, these uh, almost like a windrow of trees, because there is a symbiosis that's created, especially if you have these symbiotic microorganisms underneath, and it does save the nutrients and provide um, a, a much better environment for, for the overall um, productivity. Uh, and we can see that this uh, throughout the year actually still maintains and it's like in most instances tripled or at least doubles the yields of corn when you incorporate this agroforestry type of system. Now I will come back to this when it comes down to North Dakota because this is the most important part of sustainable agriculture in North Dakota. Another two are for increasing food production is to plant existing cropland more frequently. Uh, this will not impact North Dakota. This is more focused on sub-Saharan continent or Africa, part of Africa. Now, number nine will affect North Dakota, and that's to adapt to climate change. We will have to select different types of crops. We will have to select uh, different types of management practices as things change, if the climate does change in need as projected. And we'll discuss that again towards the end as I apply these, these concepts to North Dakota. Now, so stage one was to reduce the need for, for food source. 
The stage two is to increase the production of food. Now, stage three is to protect and restore natural ecosystems and limit agricultural land shifting. So this is to maintain. One is to decrease, one is to produce, this is to maintain. Because they do not want to expand agricultural lands. They do not want to deforest. This is primarily focused on developing nations and like, for example, South America, Central America, Brazil will be one of the countries. I'm not saying Brazil is a developing nation, but it does have deforestation issues and they do not want uh, local, regional or state governments in there cutting up the forest to create more ag fields. For number 11 is to limit inevitable cropland expansion to lands with low environmental opportunity cost. I believe this will happen in North Dakota as we go through sustainable agriculture expansion, that we will expand farming in lands that have limited biodiversity. They're somewhat low carbon storage potential, but we can produce some, some really good yields or overall farm production. So those will have to be identified, those type of fields and, and soils, and they will have to be regulated and managed. So uh, I believe this will be one of those points that uh, United States in general and North Dakota will do really well because we have web soil survey. We know where these type of lands are. We are aware of them. Meanwhile, the rest of the world does not have such an extensive information on their soils and land as we do, as we collect the data since early 1900s. Now, stage four, I'm not going to cover. This is the increase of fish supply. Apparently, uh, our current fish supplies in the world are unsustainable, are overfished, um, and will require attention from the both state, federal governments, to, to protect them and to bring this level up that will satisfy demand for, uh, for global food as a global food source. So that's a stage four. Stage five is to reduce greenhouse emission. As indicated in that uh, crop, or I'm sorry, the Congress Act, the environmental impact of agriculture is important part of sustainable agriculture or reducing the environmental impact of agriculture is important aspect. I know my students get goosebumps every time I, I talk about greenhouse gases emissions. However, every time we increase the efficiency of our system, every time we lose less nitrogen, we lose less carbon, we actually have more yields. So these two go hand in hand. According to these studies by World Resource Institute, we see that in, from 2010 to 2050, we will have increase in methane. This is the red. And uh, actually the red ones are all related to livestock production. So it's a manure management, ruminant waste on pastures and ruminant enteric fermentation. The ruminant enteric fermentation is the methane production from ruminants, cow burping. Uh, energy spent on agriculture will go up. Soil fertilization losses and creating green soil gases will still be a problem that we're going to try to reduce and farmer will love that. And then this is something that we don't control. This is the rice methane production, and this is primarily done in other continents, primarily Asia. So what do they suggest we do to reduce this research scientist? They suggest we reduce enteric fermentation through new technologies. So dairy farms will use a specific chemicals added to their feed. And they gave an example of three nitrooxypropane that will inhibit microbial methane production and hopefully in process increase animal growth size. So we will increase the efficiency of the feed while reducing the negative impact through greenhouse gas emission. 
um, and this is the impact that we have. The emissions are pretty intense according to some of these. This is kilogram of carbon that's emitted for every for every milk cow. So they will use these chemicals to reduce the fermentation and the greenhouse gas emission. Now another one, and this is going to affect North Dakota, is to reduce emission through improved manure management. And uh, now this point will require North Dakota, United States government, federal government, to come up with regulation of how we're going to store our manure. It will require technology that's going to separate manure into few different types of products and then how to properly apply it. This will require regulated farms, so farm regulation laws. Uh, there's going to be a funding for new technology that will allow us to do this, and then monitoring programs to see how well are we doing this. So uh, reduced emission through improved manure management is definitely something that should benefit everybody. Another one. This is sub stage 18 on how to reduce the greenhouse gas emission is to reduce emission from manure left on pasture. So this is after grazing. Apparently that is a big problem and they will have to add a special sub stage for this. Uh, this will require different types of products that will prevent nitrogen specifically, maybe phosphorus, but primarily nitrogen from volatilizing, going in the air or leaching out from manure that's left on the field. How are we going to do that? Well, we will have to develop a new technology that will, uh, like nitrification inhibitors, they will prevent nitrogen turning into nitrous oxide. Uh, and also, uh, how, to, how to utilize these types of inhibitors to benefit uh, our farmers and, and efficiency on the farms. Another one is to reduce emissions from fertilizer by increasing nitrogen use efficiency, overall NUE, nitrogen use efficiency, and this will be creating new fertilizers. I'm imagining new slow release fertilizers. Uh, the, the, the reason for this is because according to some of the studies, you know, this is done globally is less than a half of nitrogen that's applied as fertilizer actually goes into the plant. The rest of it is either burned off or volatilized, or it goes as a runoff into the water source, leaches out. So they're suggesting new technology. Precision Ag will help with this, right? The zoning, applying uh, uh, adequate amounts of fertilizer where it's needed, but then also slow release fertilizer, uh, fertilizer that will not volatilize in addition to using those uh, enzyme blockers to prevent uh, inefficiency and nitrogen uh, loss. So that's what research just had to say. And this is what I put in here um, to put everything in perspective. Uh, egg industry in here in the red is about 9.9% when it comes down to overall emissions by different industries. Transportation is 28, electric generation or gener generating electricity is 27, and then general industry is 22. Residential is five and commercial is seven. What I see in here is, is a give and take. What would society or government or um, the, the rest of the uh, American community or global community want to give out to have enough of food source. So there's going to always be a give and take. I think in United States as it is, 9.9% uh, .9 is not terrible and uh, is actually quite comparable to what everything else, all the other industries and how they're comparing. Um, do I believe there is a room for improvement? I always do. Now, how is going to have what is going to happen is that we as we move towards sustainable agriculture, this is going to be a hard, difficult task that will require intense planning. And understanding of resources. 
it will be managed on country, state, regional levels. I give you an example here of challenges of, to sustainable agriculture in Alaska. And Alaska will have a different types of challenges, sustainable agriculture challenges than North Dakota, of course. So you can see frozen soils and permafrost, uh, poor drainage or uh, climate and weather, cold frosts, short season, solar influences because they have dark for, for months at the time. Those are not challenges that we'll be encountering in North Dakota, for example. Now, developing your regional strategies and prioritizing tasks in North Dakota will be difficult. Why? Because we do have various soil types. We do have various soil histories. We have different moisture regimes. We have short growing season with extreme temperature range. I think only Siberia is, has a more, uh, more broad and intense temperature range. We are semi-arid climate and water controls everything. Uh, we are the state with one of the most variable crop selections. I have students from Minnesota coming in here and loving it because they're learning how to grow different types of crops. Yet we are also a less populated state. We have a limited human resources. So how are we going to implement this? Well, that's I'm going to just focus on a few of these subgroups. So subgroup seven, number one thing that we will have to do in North Dakota to be sustainable in agriculture is to improve our soil and water management. Our erosion of soil is a number one problem and number one challenge for implementing any sustainable manageable practices. Drones will not help you with erosion. We need, we have reduced water infiltration. So first of all, we don't get enough rain, but even the rain that we get, we have issues with water infiltrating our soils. We have loss of nutrients and nutrient holding capacity. We are losing drinking water quality, eutrophication of water bodies, lakes, sloughs, and uh, building soils takes time, especially in an environment like North Dakota. It's dry, it's cold. It will take 100 to 500 years. So we can't build an impressive, sustainable, agriculture fort without a really good base and uh, in this case. Another one, another point is to increase livestock and pasture productivity as specified by this research, by this big research project. Uh, so improved grazing management, improved proper pasture management, integrating crop and livestock system works really well in some areas. Um, we need to adapt to climate change. That's another point that we will have to do. Elevate precipitation. What, what everybody's saying, uh, everybody from the uh, weather industry, is that we will be getting about the same amount of precipitation delivered more intensely, meaning that we have the same amount of water coming in all of a sudden. Our soils will be have to be capable of absorbing infiltrating. Another thing that if we do have this this uh, this increased heat and increased global warming, do we need to select for different types of crops, perhaps more warm season crops? Another thing we'll have to, re to that we will have to work on that was suggested by this research group is to reduce the emission from manure left on pasture. And we do use NSERV, we use Agrotain. I do this with my students all the time. And uh, they do like it, they do see the benefits. However, every time I do use some of these chemicals, it does have a negative effect on soil microbial community and soil health. So we have to make a balance onto using and being a nitrogen efficient and not disturbing soil health. So there's going to be always something that we will have to, to work on. Another one is to reduce the emission through improved manure management. That's also proposed by this research study. And this will require expensive technology. Uh, how to separate this manure, how to store the manure, maybe even process it, and then how to apply it. 
So we will have technology and then we will need to train our farmers and ranchers on how to um, manage this manure uh, that's acquired. Another one is to reduce the emissions from fertilizer by increasing nitrogen use efficiency, the NUE, slow release fertilizers. There's going to be inorganic ones that we already have. I'm sure they're going to be more organic products in form of biochar. I can even hold a whole lecture on that. It's a, a really impressive new technology. Uh, a bonus one that I like to use is sewage, sludge as a fertilizer. We are not using it. I know North Dakota Bismarck actually does have processed sludge that can be used in ag sector. And I'm planning on doing a little study to see how can we use it? What are the 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 benefits and then are there any issues with using that as a source of phosphate because every time we use topsoil we lose phosphate phosphate is not something that we have in north dakota uh, comes from north africa and if we can have a local more sustainable form of phosphate as a fertilizer that'll be great now these are some of the sustainable agriculture components that should be addressed eventually in north dakota uh, not part of this research group uh, project, but restriction or discouragement of urbanization and development of farmland with soil of statewide importance using farmland protection strategies should be um, implemented. We do not want to use any good soil to anything other than food production. And then agriculture uh, education and expansion and open resources is a must for this state if we are going to continue um, having a sustainable agriculture implemented throughout the state. Sustainable agriculture requires a mindset set and culture change. Uh, I'm originally from Europe. My, far my parents did some farming in Europe. I knew farmers from Germany. I knew farmers from France. Farmers will say, this is how we do it because our grandparents did it. It's part of the culture. If we're going to have to change our management, we will have to change a little bit of our culture. And how to do that, the best way is to start at K-12, 1 through 12. And I will show you in a, in a second, like, how do I do that? Um, another one is the need of state research study. I believe we need to have a study on what is the producer, producer perception on various of these sustainable ag concepts that I covered and some other things I didn't cover. Why? Because as an educator, I would like to know where the knowledge gaps are. And then we can address those issues. Another one is the sustainable ag conferences. We need workshops. Uh, I used to love the Mandag Zero Till uh, conference that's not in existence anymore. Um, now we have that farming and ranching for the bottom line in February here in Bismarck. Um, I do like to attend those. I find them interesting and I do find them educational even for myself. And I'm sure farmers do as well and ranchers. Uh, North Dakota has agriculture professionals with knowledge and extensive experience. To advance this, this whole sustainable agriculture concept. However, our resources, information are kind of scattered and not necessarily always accessible. So, for example, when I'm, 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 I'm reading some of these, is, this research that's been done either by NDSU or USDA here in Mandan, I have a hard time finding journals and then I have to pay 40 or $50 to acquire it. I wish there was a hub, a place where we can actually collect and disseminate this agriculture info as an open source. This would be a wonderful thing and it will promote the sustainable agriculture in the state. This is something my dad sent me recently from Europe. It's a Reuters uh, article about the farmers trying to restore life of America's stressed soil as climate change. It's from September 14th this year and it's our North Dakota Gabe Brown. So my dad says, this is one of your farmer friends. I was like, yep, dad, I know him. So in this article, they're mentioning General Mills, Unilever, PepsiCo, and Nestle. They pledge large-scale support for regenerative agriculture practices to avoid pesticide use and inorganic fertilizers. And that out of 900 arable 
acres in United States, only about 1.5 is being farmed. So definitely there is a momentum. Definitely there is a need. There is a need, and uh, I can see that if some of this huge industry sees the benefit of this, uh, we definitely are positioning as a state really well to maybe be a flagship for all the other states in the United States on what sustainable agriculture needs to look like. When I talk, when I mentioned that there is education formation, there's we do a lot of different projects in North Dakota. I'm really impressed with what USDA does, what NDSU does, what extension services do. Um, uh, uh, this is a Burley County Soil Conservation District project that I was a little part of. The whole concept that they created is very impressive, sustainable agriculture type of project um, where they used earthworms and organic matter lying around the farm to create an impressive biodiverse homemade inoculant for seed and for soil. And like I said, there's a lot of these projects across the state that people are not aware of and that we really need to be able to share with all of our residents this cool, sustainable agriculture type of projects. Now, this is my BSc mobile lab. I like to visit high schools across the state and even out of state. I will go to Montana and South Dakota often and trying to get kids encouraged and uh, to try to get students excited about agriculture because agriculture, modern agriculture, and what we need to have to get this sustainable agriculture rolling is we need to have agriculture professionals who understand what is demand for North Dakota, what is demand for agriculture, and then imply, uh, use those skills for the benefit of the state. Um, I want to impress kids that agriculture is more than just sitting in a combine and plowing or harvesting that involves science, involves genetics, involves chemistry, involves satellite imagery. And uh, it is a definitely something that everybody can be a part of, student, re regardless of where they are from or um, regardless of what type of, um, uh, you know, inclements they have, for example, towards math or towards physics or towards welding guess what agriculture is really for all of them okay that's all i have for today and i will take your questions for, for the rest of the the time you here uh thank you so much marco that was like such a good um overview kind of about sustainable agriculture globally um, I kind of wanted to, I was thinking about some questions just about, um, we have so many small producers in our state, and those are the people that I work with directly, more of the farmer's market vendors, they might have an oversized garden, a 10 acre farm, just on the small scale, what can these producers do to kind of help the overall cause of sustainability when farming? So that's an excellent question. And in a lot of these areas where sustainable agriculture actually works, there are small farms. So uh, starting small actually makes sense because you can be a little bit more observant. You, you have a little bit less expenses uh, to start up. Uh, switching big farms to sustainable agri agriculture methodology will be more difficult because it's it's all about uh, you, you don't have time to pay attention to this uh, to this little uh, segments or little uh, let's say uh, results that your action could could do like you're in a hurry to harvest you're in a hurry to seed because you have so many acres to cover and and that's usually where this inefficiency happens um, over time I believe that with improvement of technology it's going to be easier for those farmers, and especially if there's an incentive, but uh, for those big farmers to commit more to sustainable practices. But uh, in the long run, this, uh, and in the short run, the small farmers, uh, uh, even urban gardens, uh, could be uh, urban farming, I'm sorry, 
could be a kind of like a gateway, uh, an easy uh, way to to start learning processes that are part of the sustainable agriculture. Awesome. My other question too that I was thinking, I'm not a rancher, so maybe this is something that a lot of our ranchers might know, but those chemicals that you were talking about that kind of help um, with manure management, is that something that's easy for them to get? Like, could I go down to Ronnie's, let's say, and purchase some of that? And is it really affordable? So, yeah, so some of these are actually available right now. And they're, they're what they call them is enzyme blockers. And they will block uh, different types of enzymes. They can convert different forms of, let's say, nitrogen. And it doesn't get volatilized. So instead of going up in the air, it actually stays longer on top of your soil or hopefully in your soil. And then plants, like uh, if you're a rancher, you probably have grasses, they will take advantage of it before it gets volatilized. So it's a win-win. Now, the, the, it's going to be a cost effect, right? So how expensive is, is this enzyme? And can you see the benefit of it uh, when you're a farmer? Uh, yes, if somebody gives you incentive to, oh, yes, well, if you, if you don't do this and we penalize you because you emit so much uh, nitrogen, then yes, you may have to buy it. But otherwise, they'll have to see what is the pricing. And then there are studies out there to tell you like, OK, per pound of manure, how much would you save in nitrogen versus how much would you lose? Especially if you bought that manure, that will make a lot of sense to apply these what they call enzyme blockers. Awesome. Carrie, do you have any questions? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Well, um, if nobody else has any questions, I think this will be a wrap up. We're like right at an hour, so that worked out perfectly. Thank you so much. That was yes. super fascinating. I okay. hope to have you, you back again, Marco. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Just let me know, yes, if there's a particular subject that we need to cover. Absolutely. Maybe we'll cover more about this. We'll see. So, okay. Thank you again. Have a great day. Okay, thank you.